So last year we started out with about 50 then we got down to 22 after a really bad year of kestrels and a couple of uh, fledgling um, firebirds. So we got uh, this incubator and we got separately some that I collected about a week later so Technically, they would have been able to fit in there, but um, with the others, but it's two different dates that they're going to be hatching. So we got about uh, a little over 20, uh, almost two dozen. I don't want 50 chickens again. The year before, we had almost no predators, and that's why that's why we end up having 50 adults last year. Because the year before last year, we had. Um, like I said, a, a lack of predators and things, and actually I misjudged it. Um, so, you know, good rule of thumb is, you know, you want to, uh, if, if you want, say if you want five more, five, five or six more chickens, <laughs> you want to hatch out probably 15. A, a, a normal year, 15 or 16, because, um, you know, in a normal year, a lot are going to get taken. That's just how free range is, truly free range like this. And you have to account for it also that not all of them are going to hatch, you know, even if they look good up until the last day, not all, they're never going to all hatch. That just doesn't ever, um, even if you do everything right, you know, that doesn't ever happen. So very rare to get all of them hatch so you got to account for some that won't hatch you got to account for predators and things and i don't know if i mentioned this or not i don't, I don't think i did but part of the deaths about let's see about a fourth or a fifth of the deaths last year ended up being due to um fatty liver which is uh, something that they get if they give them too many cookies i did not know that they were that easily susceptible to it so um we we fix that issue but um you're gonna have to just kind of monitor you know uh especially when you've got too many cookies and in spring and summer time when they don't need the extra calories and they also got you know they're 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 getting their um a lot of bugs and things that have a lot of fat and protein extra fat and protein in spring and summer so it's, it's easy to do even if you're not get them, giving them cookies. Sometimes it can, they can just find too many bugs and it can happen. I mean, seriously, I didn't realise just how easy it was. So um, we really have cut back on not only the cookies but the amount of food that we give them. Um, of course, they're still nice and have a good weight on them, but they're not chunky. They're not overweight. So we we really have to watch for that this year as well especially because our older hens are going to be um you know more susceptible to that than the younger ones there's pat's our rooster he's doing really good he's the father of all those eggs that are going to hatch in about a week or so uh, one stood hatch this week another uh clutch is due to hatch the week after um so he'll be the dad to all those and uh to be honest i don't know for sure uh Who's the mom for all the ch all the eggs that are gonna hatch? You gonna just you know some some you never know. <laughs> some you can kind of tell that they've got traits of the mom somewhere, and you can kind of figure out who might have laid it. But so anyway, yeah, Pat Pat has got a really good fertility rate, and even better than our other rooster that when he was in his prime. Our other rooster was kind of sad. He passed away last year. So, Due to, you know, like old age plus, I think he might have gotten taken by something because he started to get really slow. Um, anyway, so Ravenwing was our older rooster that you know, he was about six years old and he passed away, sadly. Anyway, he wasn't ever that fertile. And so when I was collecting eggs from Patch and these hens, I did not expect the fertility to be what it was and so I collected a little too many and um, they all, literally every single one ended up being fertile despite only one rooster for 22 hens. 
every single one end up being first of all so um it'd be a shame not to keep them you know it'd be, it'd be a shame not to keep those extra eggs you know i would have only had i known they're all going to be fertile i would have only incubated about 10 15 um but you know this once you realize there's something growing in there it'd be it'd be a shame to to just you know and, and kind of brutal too to just you know throw it away after you know it's something living in there so we're going to try to hatch them out all of them anyway and um honestly it probably won't end up being too many because um it looks like it's early season but it looks like we're going to have a really bad again predator season i don't know for sure uh, i could be wrong but um you know we're going to hatch out two dogs and we'll probably only get about eight to nine that that make it to adulthood even if you keep them in the brooder till they're half grown you know there's always something in a normal year by autumn if we've got 50 50 in summer or 50 ish in summer in a normal year by autumn we usually are cut down to 40 and then by winter we're cut down to probably you know 38 36 you know so um you know that that's a normal year so the, the fact that we kept all 50 uh you know until last year's summer that was that was that was unnatural so we would do for a for an over uh over um aggressive predator year you know that's just you know she's what you get this is how farming works you know if you say everything's going really good why is everything going really really good <laughs> it's because later later you're gonna pay for it so this is mildly interesting um had somebody give a um donation of scratch grains so we used it some of it for the quail and some of it for the uh, chickens as a little treat you know can't can't give them that as their complete diet but we gave them a little treat right <laughs> the quail ate everything literally everything except the um the barley and so <laughs> the barley actually sprouted and we're gonna just let it grow and see if it grows us some barley um why not so we can, we're gonna see if the barley actually turns into barley <laughs> quail are starting to shed their winter feathers that's how warm it's been it's been unnaturally warm it's, they're not supposed to do that yet in just a couple of weeks uh the grass has just i mean it's it's bounced back it's it's bright green and it's winter time and grass is not supposed to be like you know growing back right now it's supposed to be you know, it's it's just you know barely uh, March you know it's, it's supposed to still be snow on the crown but um, even though I'm complaining I don't think the quail are complaining they uh, fare off in winter quite well they got a lot of heavy down and things that keep them warm but I think they um, just naturally enjoy springtime I don't understand why but they do we got some burdock and things, uh, dockweed and the different different uh, species of dock in here, um, in with the quail, and the quail are actually is this this is wild growing, but the quail are actually fertilizing naturally fertilizing the, these um, kind of wild existing. We didn't plant the dock; it just uh, volunteered on its own, which is kind of nice. That's always a, a nice uh, gift when that happens. Here's a spot where last year I had to, a big, big spot, I had to kill off some invasive weeds. And I tried my very best to keep the dock, you know, to, to not kill anything where I saw dockweed. I tried my best. I did have to kill off a lot of grass, but I tried my very best to spare anything that I saw. I don't think I was able to spare every last plant, but 
you know and you can see some of the grass finally starting to grow back in the places that I treated but until the grass grows back completely we're still going to have some of these barren patches from last year when I when I had to kill off invasive weeds and there would be nothing left other than those weeds no other plant if I had not done that they, they, they will take over everything I don't know what they're called um, but they will take over an, an entire pasture, an entire paddock and you won't have anything left so not only do we need the grass for the quail to feel like they have places to kind of play in and hide in and things and make little little nests and tunnels in but we also need those those uh, beneficial herbs you know we don't want to kill those just because an invasive weed is taking over so this was a, uh, a species of mugwort last year so we're hoping that that'll come back at least the seeds will you know spray new ones fortunately it's not the kind of species that makes golden moxa it's kind of actually quite difficult to make moxa out of this but it's still mugwort it's still nice no actual eggs yet but we have heard a couple roosters crowing on the warmer days which makes me think that eggs are coming soon quail have a breeding season and they do not lay eggs typically do not lay eggs unless it's like one stray egg here or there um, unless it's during the breeding season unlike chickens which can lay all year round something I really look forward to every year is eggs are really tasty and we are going to hatch out uh, a new batch of quail from these eggs as well I've got at least six or seven different breeding lines in this flock and my goal is to breed all of them together so that we get a stronger breeding line because a lot of, lot of unfortunately a lot of especially jumbo quail um caternix quail in general they are just um really inbred have a lot of problems spinal problems eye problems uh, neurological problems and we're trying to prevent all that by taking six different breeding lines and mixing them together some of these breeding lines are naturally better than others we've tried our best to leave anybody in here even if they're not uh the best for breeding we've tried to, as long as they're nice as long as they're um as long as they're, they're they're not mean and aggressive we have tried to leave them in um as long as whatever they've got going on doesn't interfere with their quality of life so you may see a couple quail in here they've got a little bit of a you know uh mild spine issue or eye issue or something where their eye eyelids are a different shape or whatever but I'm a big you know believer in don't punish something that is just existing that you know they have a good quality of life they're not in pain don't cull them and punish them because because they're not good for breeding instead fix your breeding line hit it at the the true problem the the true um, issue is not an individual animal passing along a genetic trait it's the fact that your gene pool is not wide enough if you've got a big gene pool you know then typically typically I won't say always but typically um, that, that all those inbred issues will go away so even if you've got an inbred breeding to a totally different gene pool you know if you've got six different breeding lines together you know you've only got several di generations to finally to get a much larger you know genetic um and it's very difficult at that point when you've got all those genes mixing together to have anything inbred anymore the inbreeding is what is the issue so you fix you can fix a breeding line like that without having to cull 
something just because it's not perfect you can still get pretty good bays you know even from something that doesn't have a good breeding line had you breed it with with other breed in, intermingle it with other breeding lines you know so you, you, they can still produce very strong offspring you know and you can give them a nice bountiful life that they deserve um, instead of cutting their life short just because they're not perfect.